Good morning, Matt here. Gonna hopefully finish First Thessalonians 4 today. Um, we saw that Paul was kind of getting into the didactic portion of his letter, the teaching, the deeper waters. He's telling them to abstain from sexual immorality, increase in love, do so more and more, watch how you're walking. Others are you kind of others are watching kind of a deal. Now he gets to uh, verse 13 and he talks about death because the church in Thessalonica was worried about death. People were dying and they didn't know if they were going to miss out on the on the resurrection. So Paul addresses that here. Verse 13, But we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep, that means who are dead, that you may not grieve as others do who have no hope. Uh, Paul's telling them, don't grieve like the Gentiles. Don't grieve like the pagans who have no hope. You have hope now. And this hope isn't, I hope Jesus comes back. I hope I see him when I die. It's not that. Hope is, in the New Testament, is defined as joyful expectation. So he's saying, you have this joyful expectation that you know you will meet Jesus. Kind of teaching them as he's encouraging them. Verse 14, For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, of course we do, we can't be born again Christians without believing in the resurrection. That's where all the power is. So since we believe that, even so, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep, those who have died. God's going to bring them with him. Jesus is going to bring them with him when he comes back. For that, we go to one of my favorite passages in the Bible. I say that all the time. Uh, Revelation 19, verse 11 through 16. Then I saw heaven open. This is a picture of Jesus coming back. It's going to be awesome. Then I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. The one sitting on it was called Faithful and True. That's our Jesus. And in righteousness, he judges and makes war. He's coming back. And if you're on the wrong side of Jesus, when he comes back, it will be a terrible day. He judges and makes war. His eyes are like a flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems, which are crowns. And he has on his name, and he has a name written that no one knows but himself. He is clothed in a robe dipped in blood, most likely the blood of his enemies, not his own. And the name by which he is called is the Word of God. And the armies of heaven arrayed in fine linen, white and pure, were following him on white horses. And the armies in heaven arrayed in fine linen, white and pure. A white that we can't even describe. A white that is not even on our color charts. We're following him on, a white, ho on white horses. That's the believers that have died before us. From his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. He will tread the winepress of fury of the wrath of God, the Almighty, on his robe, on his thigh, and on his thigh, he has a name written, King of Kings, Lord of Lords. That's our Jesus. He's coming back. That's, uh, he's going to come back with those who have preceded us, those who have died uh, previously. God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. We just saw that. Verse 15, For this we declare to you by a word from the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of our Lord, will not precede those who have fallen asleep. So he's just saying that those who have died... They're going to go. They're going to go meet with Jesus. We know in Philippians 1.20 and 123, Paul says, For me to live is Christ, to die is gain. It's, he's saying that it's, it's great for me that I live so I can teach you all about Jesus, but I'd rather be with him, to be honest with you. So we know that when we die, we meet Jesus. And uh, he's answering their question here that those who die are going to be with the Lord. Don't worry about it. Verse 16. Actually, a quick comment on 14. Um, that those who have fallen asleep, they're going to show up with Jesus. He doesn't give a lot of details here. Uh, and I don't know that it really matters. That what the point is, is we're going to see Jesus when we die. We're going to get into a little bit about pre-trip and post-trip, but not too, too much. Um, verse 16. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel. We're going to hear a voice of an archangel, a cry of command from Jesus, and the sound of of the trumpet of God. That sound is going to be so awesome. It will be indescribable. It will be undeniable. It will be the sound of God, the trumpet of God. It will be unlike any sound we've ever heard. It will be a, a joyful, wonderful, awesome, and terrible, wretched. Oh, it's going to be so terrible for those people who are not in Christ. Wretched's a bad word. Nothing God does is wretched. But you know what I mean. It's going to be horrific. For those who are not in Christ, it will be, and there will be no time to repent. No, nope. he will come like a thief in the night, 
and there will be no time to repent. If you're not right with Jesus when he comes back, you are going to hell. Um, so the sound of the trumpet and the dead in Christ will rise first, like he said. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with him in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we always will be with the Lord. From that point on, we're always going to be with him. We have no idea how wonderful that will be, but I want it. I want it now. I want to be with him. Verse 18, Therefore encourage one another with these words. Paul's writing this to be encouraged. He's not writing this to open up some long-standing debate between pre-trib and post-trib. Uh, I am going to give my opinion on it, and I'm going to tell you I'm in baby land on this. I'm in baby land on this. But as I read, uh, I think that it's, it's, it's clear that there is no rapture. That's, um, I shouldn't say it's clear. That's the way I see it, okay? Um, there's no rapture. L let's read verse, let's read Matthew 24, okay? So in Matthew 24, I'm going I'm to read 29 through 31. But the verses previous to this are talking about how terrible it's going to be in the end, end days. And we're starting that now, I believe. And then here's what happens in verse 29, Matthew 24, 19. Immediately after the tribulation, after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light and the stars will fall from heaven and the powers of heavens will be shaken. Then, at that point, then, after all that, then will appear in heaven the sign of the Son of Man. And then all the tribes on the earth will mourn and they will see the Son of Man come, coming in the clouds of heaven. Why will they mourn? Because they're not ready for Him. And, and they, they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory, indescribable glory. And He will send out His angels with a loud trumpet call, which we just heard, and they will gather His elect. They will gather His elect, all of His elect. Not some now, not some later. They will gather his elect the four, from the four winds, from the end, from one end of heaven to the other. They will gather his elect. We are his elect. So he's going to come back and he's going to gather us. Here's the question I have, which is not completely described. Uh, the question is, what happens? You know, when when Jesus comes back, do we we get caught up with him, along with the dead people? They come first, and we're right right after him. The way I see it. We meet him in the air, and then I think we come back with him uh, where he's going to rule and reign on earth. That's what I think. But again, I'm, I'm still kind of exploring this. There's two Greek words uh, that describe this. One is apentesis, and the other is hypentesis. And this is, these are terms used to describe dignitaries. Uh, and, and that's what Jesus is. The Greek term apentesis is often used as uh, of an important dignitary's reception from the inhabitants of a city who come out and greet him and welcome him as an honored guest with fanfare and celebration. That's what I, I see happening here. Jesus comes back, we get caught up, and we're set, we're, yes, Jesus is here. And then we most likely come back down with him. Now, comment on that if you want. Just, just be kind about it. Be graceful about it. Um, and the, the hypothesis that's uh, that's a term talking about a, a downward motion. I, I'm reading this from the notes that I got. This is the only thing I used here. It may indicate the subsequent movement of the saints after meeting Christ in the air conforms to his direction. So after they meet Christ in the air, they conform to where he was going. It kind of ties in with the first description. We get caught up with Jesus, and then we come back with him down to earth. It's not clear what's going to happen when we get caught up with him, if we're going to come back or go up to heaven. Um, but it doesn't matter. Here's what matters. Jesus is coming back. That's what matters. Paul didn't write this to open up some age-old debate about pre-trib and post-trib. He wrote it. Why? He wrote it to comfort those. He wrote it, therefore, to encourage one another. That's the takeaway. The takeaway is this. Jesus is coming back, and if you're not right with him, you are going to be so sorry. It's going to be a sorry, a sorrow that you can't even describe, uh, and it's for eternity. And in eternity, for us, those of us who are saved, we're not going to be wondering and and debating over whether it was a pre-trip or post-trip. We're not even going to be thinking about it. We're going to be saying, "Holy, holy, holy is the Lord! Holy is the Lord!" We're going to be worshiping Him forever. 
Get right with Jesus. Repent. You must be born again to inherit the kingdom of God. Okay? Peace. See you soon.